Hi, my name is Christopher Malcolm and welcome to Movable Canvas, where we talk about the movies and what makes a good movie into a great film. With the new year just getting started and before the Academy Awards season gets into full swing, I'd like to take a look back at 2018 and 10 of the top films from that year that I think are some of the prime examples of how good movies can become great ones. You can call it my top 10 list, if you will. That is if I got to vote for the Academy Awards. I, I don't get to vote for the Academy Awards. That would be cool though. But at any rate, here are my 10 favorite films from 2018 and a little explanation as to why I think they sit a bit above the fold. Will any of these movies actually make it into the Oscars list for the 10 top movies in the year? Maybe not, but it's a fun exercise anyway. At number 10, we'll start with a documentary, Won't You Be My Neighbor, which takes a look at a man that many of us grew up with but knew very little about. That's right, the man in the red sweater, Mr. Rogers. At a time when hatred seems to have re-emerged and confusion and kind of darkness seem pervasive, it's no surprise that one of the breakout films of the year was a movie about a guy who specialized in dealing with tough issues and making them palatable to children, but also to adults alike. At the age I was when Mr. Rogers was on the air, I didn't think much of it other than it was that show with the nice guy on it that my mom put on when she was tired of dealing with me. But looking back at the way Mr. Rogers dealt with issues as far reaching as racism and suicide and different issues that were very confusing and continue to be very confusing to, to children of a young age, um, it becomes clear that not only was Mr. Roger, Rogers providing entertainment, but he was also providing a very necessary service. You also learn in the documentary that the former priest who taught the world a little bit about treating everyone with kindness wasn't always treated with such kindness himself. Yet he dealt with it all with grace and sincerity, and I think even for us adults out there, we could still all use a little more Mr. Rogers. At number nine, we move from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to a place a little bit more exotic. That's right, Wakanda. It's pretty funny that one of the biggest controversies this year was when the Academy floated the idea of introducing a best popular film category to the competition. Of course, this was a terrible idea and it was quickly retracted. Clearly bowing to the pressure of the television network, it, it was wrongheaded for a number of reasons. First, just because a lot of people go to see a movie doesn't mean it's actually good. It means it was marketed well. Two, just because people don't go see a movie doesn't mean it's not good. I'll take for an example a movie this year that was not on my list. So some midway through the year, a movie called, came out called A Boy, A Girl, and A Dream. It was kind of a before sunrise, before sunset type movie about a young couple um, basically meeting and, and falling in love over the course of one night, that night happening, happening to be the, uh, the election of Donald Trump. Of course, there's one minor difference between this movie and Before Sunset, uh, being that the couple in this particular case were both African-American. Apparently assuming that mass audience wouldn't go see a movie about two uh, African-Americans falling in love, studio decides to just dump the movie uh, into one theater for a very short period of time before moving it onto video. The fact that it was very well received by critics doesn't seem to have factored in at all. In fact, I bet a number of you out there have never even heard of this movie, and it's not your fault. I live in Los Angeles where you can see virtually every independent film made, and even I had to look really hard to try to find it. There was little press. I don't even think I ever saw a trailer, to be honest with you. And as you'd expect, it didn't do much box office. Now, does the fact that it didn't break box office records mean it wasn't a good movie? I mean, it's pretty hard to break a box office record when you're working at a one theater in only a handful of cities. On the flip side of that, the latest entry from the Marvel franchise, Black Panther, had no trouble breaking records. Black Panther took the box office by storm, celebrated both for its storytelling and for the diversity of its cast. First, it's put to bed once again that old adage that films featuring minority casts can't do boco box office here in the States or travel overseas. This is a theory that's been proven wrong again and again, but for some reason still serves as an excuse for many studio heads to pass on certain films starring certain kinds of cast. Of course, Black Panther had an additional superpower on his side, that being that it was another part of the behemoth uh, Marvel franchise. They could have just rested on their laurels and put out a yet another superhero movie that you go in, you watch, and you walk out, and five minutes later you've forgotten everything that you just saw. Instead, they handed the reins to one of the best directors in the business, Ryan Coogler, 
who took the film from being just a superhero movie to being a whole senior thesis on the African diaspora. To be sure, not everyone who went to see it at the box office got every single level the film was working on, and that's okay. You don't break box office records by only having scholars and social justice warriors in the seats. Having a conversation about Black Panther with a friend of mine, a very intelligent, very kind woman, uh, she was telling me how much she enjoyed the film. I immediately concurred. I told her it was such a fantastic way that they were able to tell not only the story of slavery, about man's responsibility to his fellow man, and even how they are able to work in Michael B. Jordan's character um, and have him be, you know, the bad guy but without being truly evil. Of course, as soon as I said that Michael B. Jordan wasn't completely evil, a very confused look brushed over her face. I should probably mention that she's not African American. What do you mean he's not evil? He killed that old lady in the cave. She does have a point there. But what I meant by that is that what the film's major kind of through line is, is really is dealing with the idea of how much responsibility do we have for our brothers and sisters? This operates on several levels. Starting with the most clear and simple level, we would start with the idea of slavery. In this hypothetical Marvel universe where Wakanda exists, you have basically this insanely rich African nation that is rich in um, minerals, has money, has art artillery, has all the tools of a great nation. Just as Africa in real life is loaded with minerals and there were many great civilizations uh, in Africa at the time of the transatlantic slave trade. So the film works in a very basic question, which is uh, from someone like Killmonger, uh, Michael B. Jordan's character, uh, who went to the, you know, who was trafficked to the United States via, via slavery, uh, and then someone like uh, the Black Panther himself, who was, was back in Africa enjoying the riches and protecting his home turf. Uh, one of Michael B. Jordan's basic questions is, well, you know, why didn't you come get us? Why didn't you help us? Which is an interesting question because, in, in, you know, you, it, it's, it I guess, speaks to a larger theme. Obviously, when you're talking about Wakanda, you're talking about, you know, a hypothetical uh, land, people with superpowers. But in general, it does raise a really kind of interesting question uh, about, you know, during the transatlantic slave trade, uh, why didn't some of the wealthier African nations help their brethren? But of course, this extends further. Uh, to a very constant question within the African-American community, which is, you know, each one teach one, right? Uh, is the idea of, you know, those of the talented 10th, the people who succeed, the people who are able to reach uh, the heights of the American dream, uh, you're often put in the question, you're put in a position where you have to worry about, you know, do I take care of myself or what is my responsibility to some of my fellow African Americans who may have not made it out uh, of the neighborhood, who may have not reached the same heights that I have, what is my responsibility as someone who has reached those heights to help them? I think a lot of people have the question of, you know, how much responsibility they have for their family, for their friends. But I think with African Americans, it becomes somewhat of a more acute question uh, because if you look at the economics and, you know, the idea of social mobility and the differences between that, between the races. So Black Panther doesn't shy away from that question. It really kind of di dives into the idea of, you know, the talented 10th, what is their responsibility to everyone else? Is it okay to just bask in the glory of your success? Or as Af African Americans, do you have the responsibility to reach back and help your fellow brother in need? Killmonger performed some terrible actions to be sure. I reference again the poor woman in the cave. But is his initial thesis all that wrong? Doesn't Wakanda, given its wealth and status, owe a certain responsibility to help out its fellow man and not just look inward and protect itself? In fact, Shala's ultimate arc is really kind of coming closer to Michael B. Jordan's uh, position rather than f further away. He may not embrace Killmonger's tactics, but he does come to understand the thought process behind them. For number eight, we'll stick with another film with the word black in the title, Spike Lee's Black Klansman. Spike Lee has been one of my favorite directors for as long as I've been watching movies. Bold, brave, and sometimes infuriating, he's never afraid to take a risk and always leaves every idea on the screen. Never afraid to piss people off, often dismissively called the proverbial angry black man, Spike is anything but shy. But if you look beyond the fervor that tends to be aimed at him personally, he's one heck of a filmmaker. Black Klansman originates from the true story of Ron Stallworth, 
a black police officer in Colorado in the 1970s who infiltrates the Ku Klux Klan. Yes, you heard that right. But what makes the movie so brilliant is not only the high concept, but Spike's execution. While the topic is heavy, the treatment is comedic. And with the situation itself so absurd, Spike pulls no punches in letting the humor flow. At the same time, between the chuckles, you get to get at the larger ideas of identity. For me, the most interesting character in the movie isn't Stallworth or any of the more prominent Klansmen. The most interesting character, in my opinion, is actually Flip, played by Adam Driver, who is Ron Stallworth's partner with the police department. He's the actual face to Ron Stallworth's voice. Because, uh, you know, for obvious reasons, Ron can't exactly just walk into a Klan meeting. But Flip takes his own secret into these Klan meetings. Flip is Jewish. Visually, he codes as white, so he's able to infiltrate the meetings, even going so far as to get, become a card-carrying member of the Ku Klux Klan. Of course, this puts him in a lot of physical peril. I mean, he could be found out at any moment. But the movie's most interesting conflict is actually within Flip himself. While the color of a black person's skin makes it, well, literally impossible to go through life not realizing you're black or not realizing that you're the only black person in the room, being Jewish is something different. As I said, Flip visually could look white, meaning that it's not something he has to think about when he walks into a room with other white people that may not happen to be Jewish. Because of that, he finds himself on kind of the edge of two worlds. Yes, he's Jewish, but he's not very religious and hasn't made faith a very big part of his life. Now, up close, attending these Klan meetings and hearing all the awful things they're saying about him without actually knowing he's a Jewish person himself puts him into a completely different kind of headspace. Like many African Americans, he's now no longer afforded the luxury of being able to live his life with his ethnicity in the background. And because that's a privilege that black people will never enjoy, that tends to put Flip and Ron on parallel journeys. Like Black Panther, the film works as a standalone genre piece. You can totally enjoy the thriller aspect of it without diving into the social politics behind it all. But when you peel back the layers, you realize that Spikes made a film not only viscerally engaging, but also emotionally and intellectually engaging, and it works on several levels. For number seven, we go to the world of animation, to the wonderful Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Yes, I'm as surprised as anybody that this is on my list. If, if you're my friend for more than five minutes, you'll probably know that I'm not a big animation film person, nor am I a big superhero person. But in some cases like this one, it, the filmmaking really does go to another level uh, and it's worthy of recognition. You know, a lot has been said in recent years about diversity. And of course that means different things to different people. Some see diversity in entertainment as the gold standard, as a, a symbol of acceptance. Others view diversity with disdain, seeing any ground made up by one segment of people as somehow being taken away from their own people. Of course, these people fail to realize that we're all members of the same human family and that we should, in the end, want everyone to succeed. <laughs> you know, Matt Damon uh, got himself into trouble on his show Project Greenlight a couple years ago when he tried to mansplain to a black woman that diversity was only about actors. It had nothing to do with what was going on behind the, the, behind the scenes as if a building's curb appeal is only important for what's on the outside and as if it doesn't matter at all what kind of architect built the foundation. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse shows the value of diverse voices at all stages of production. Starting with the obvious, this time Spider-Man, or well, one of the Spider-Man, is played by a young black Latino boy in Brooklyn. The filmmakers could have easily made him a caricature. They could have easily painted it with broad strokes turning him into some kind of black-faced version of Peter Parker. No, probably no one would have complained, even if some people in the audience might have sighed a little bit. But instead, the filmmakers directed Miles Morales to be exactly what he is. A smart, charismatic young man of color growing up in Brooklyn. Unlike most cartoons, I was constantly impressed by just how real the character was. Not, not necessarily in terms of graphics or resolution, but it just in the way Miles moved and his mannerisms and the way he would flirt with a girl. There's a scene very early in the movie where he's walking through the city greeting his friends and he just felt so real to me. He felt very authentic. I felt like, I, I, you know, seeing that scene, I was like, I know that kid. I've seen that kid. I've, I've met that kid. His character was real and lived in. It should be said that a great deal of this is due to the immense charisma of Shamik Moore, who plays Miles Morales. That kid's got a real future on him, and I really hope that he gets some significant roles to be able to show off what he can do. But credit is also due to the filmmakers who sunk their teeth into every detail, from Miles' sneakers to what kind of music he might listen to. Not the type of music you usually hear in an animated movie. 
they made every detail of his life real and relevant, which is not something easy to do when you're talking about a movie about a kid who shoots webs from his wrist. For number six, we go halfway around the world for the curious suspense thriller, Burning. Well, I guess it's halfway around the world if you live in Los Angeles. If you live in Korea, it's probably just down the street. I use the word curious to describe it because much of the suspense is in our head. Or is it? The brilliance of the film is that throughout much of its two and a half hour running at a time, it keeps us guessing. Like life, we're presented with just enough facts to feed our assumptions. But we're never completely sure that what we think is happening is actually happening. The story is about a love triangle between a farm worker, Lee jong Su, a ridiculously beautiful former classmate, Shin, and his third mysterious suitor, Ben, played by Steven Young of The Walking Dead. Having completely fallen in love with Shin, and who wouldn't, Lee is heartbroken when she takes up with his other man, Ben. He puts on a brave face as the proverbial guy stuck in the friend zone, and even shares some awkward three-way dates with the two of them. But the more time he spends with Ben, this kind of upscale, clean-cut member of the 1%, the more he starts to suspect that things may not be exactly as they seem. Ben helps along the suspicion by making several offhand comments that seem to indict him for some pretty sinister acts. But here's the thing. Is Ben really evil? Or is Lee, and by extension we, just assuming he's evil because he's taking Shin away? Class differences play a major role in the film, with Ben being from the upper upper class and Lee being a poor farmer. Lee and Shin not only have to navigate this new three-way relationship, but they also have to navigate this new world of the ultra-rich that they're being introduced to as a result of their relationship with Ben. It's a world of financial excess and luxury that neither one of them is accustomed to. Like in most societies, the uber-rich in South Korea can get away with, well, pretty much anything they want. So when Ben seems to make a certain admission later in the film, it seems plausible. Yet still we don't know that he's saying what we think he's saying. He could just be joking. Steven Young's kind of deadpan delivery has a way of keeping everyone a little off balance, not knowing completely how serious to take him or uh, exactly if what he's saying is what they think he's saying. We have nothing to go on except for our suspicions, largely influences by Ben's class position, as well as the emotional feelings of a man who has a broken heart because the girl he's in love with has just been taken away from him. Not exactly the most reliable starting points of view. So when the final climactic moment of the film arrives, and I won't tell you what happens, but uh, we are kind of asked to wonder, okay, well, who exactly was the bad guy in this movie? Were we really seeing what we thought we were seeing? Or were our minds just playing tricks on us? Number five on my list comes from closer to home. Much closer. It's eighth grade from director and former YouTube star, Bo Burnham. And I suspect this film will hit home for many viewers in more ways than one. Especially how the film genuinely seems to capture the awkwardness, excitement, pain, and joy of being a kid of a certain age. Of course, I can say with all honesty that I've never been a 13-year-old girl. That's a big surprise. Yet I think that everyone can relate to that idea of being at that certain age where you're just kind of figuring out who you are. And I think in the days of social media and YouTube and vlogging, uh, where you're expected to put on a certain face to the world at all times, that can be especially difficult for a kid who doesn't know what that face is supposed to be yet. The whole film is kind of framed by Kayla, who's the lead character, is framed by Kayla's uh, attempt to start a YouTube channel. But that's only the fake Kayla. That's only the, that's only the image of Kayla that she thinks that people want to see. There's a scene later in the film where it's a pool party. Um, and you know, you're at that age where your bodies are still developing. You're not, you're not quite a woman. You're not quite a girl. You're not quite a boy. You're not quite a man. Um, and it's just a simple scene where the entire drama is derived from the absolute terror that's induced when this young woman tries to put on a swimsuit for the first time and has to walk out in front of all her friends. Now, it may seem like a little insignificant, but the scene is played uh, so perfectly by the director and so wonderfully by this young actress that you really feel her fear in the moment and you understand that because I think we've all been at a certain age before. We've all been at certain stages in life where we feel awkward, we feel a little bit unsure of ourselves. Um, 
And in particular, that case where you're walking out into a pool party, a whole backyard full of uh, a bunch of kids who none of them really feel confident about themselves, probably, um, makes it all the more daunting. It makes it all the more of a, a significant step she's trying to take. You know, the age is so filled with fear and uncertainty. Um, you know, everything is new. Uh, and you kind of know what you think you want, but you don't know what you want. And you don't know where all the pitfalls are yet. Uh, there's a brilliant scene later in the film, which I will not ruin for you, uh, where the character is put into a rather precarious position. Um, and she doesn't really realize that she's in a precarious position until she's in it. Um, and let's just say that scene could have gone a lot of different ways, but uh, Burnham plays it just perfectly. Uh, and uh, it's really one of the best scenes of the year. Caitlin's relationship with her father, Mark, is actually only one of the subplots of the film, but I think uh, it really sums up a lot of the power that's in the film. Mark, like most fathers, is trying to get close to his daughter. He's, tr he's trying to understand the person that he loves the most. And like most fathers, he does it in an incredibly awkward way. Um, you know, whereas she's a child and she's trying to understand her way around the world, understand how to do things, but not quite sure. He, as a parent, is also not completely sure how to interact with this person uh, as, much as, as much as he wants to, as badly as he wants to. He doesn't completely know how to, to speak her language. Uh, but, he, but one thing's for sure, he loves her a lot. Uh, but in his enthusiasm, he tends to make a mess out of things, which I think is also could be said of, you know, kids that age. You know, you're trying so hard to be something uh, that you can get yourself into a lot of trouble. Um, but it's just part of the growing pain. It's part of the joy of life. And I think uh, eighth grade, more than any film I've seen really in recent years, uh, really captures that essence of what it's like to be a kid um, and what it's like to be a living, learning human being. Number four of my film is yet another example of the BS behind the idea that a film with an ethnic cast can't cross over and become a box office bonanza. It's one of the most, most loved films of 2018, Crazy Rich Asians. The first Hollywood movie with a majority Asian cast for the last 25 years. Boy, that sounds even more ridiculous when you say it out loud. Was a big hit with moviegoers. The film is brash, big, exquisite, sometimes ridiculous. Much like the world Rachel Chu finds herself in when she returns to Singapore with her fiance to meet his family. Crazy, wild, and over the top, the world centers around Eleanor Young, mother of Nick Young, who's kind of the family matriarch, played by the astounding Michelle Yeoh. From one of the wealthiest families on the island, Eleanor rules her fiefdom with the iron grip of a royal. Like many a well-born woman, she puts a premium on loyalty and dignity and appearances. Her family is set a standard, and she expects everyone around her, especially her favorite son Nick, to abide by them. Those standards do not include Nick bringing home someone to, in her eyes, is a commoner. I guess it would be like the equivalent of Prince William bringing home Cardi B. I don't think it would go very well. What ensues, of course, is romantic comedy 101, a genre that I particularly love, uh, but it's been a bit off of its game for like the last 10, 15 years. The movie careens for moments of absolute romance. I too now demand a river during my wedding. To absolute humor, is there anything Aquafina can't do? But it all comes together in a film that not only has a good bit of humor at the expense of the excesses of a certain culture, but also tends to uh, respect its traditions and understand the love and the reasoning behind some of the, uh, some of the antics. Of all the movies on my list, this is the one I purchased first when it came out on video, and I look forward to watching it again and again as the years roll along. Let's just hope it's not another 25 years before a cast like this is able to come together and put out another great work of art. As we head to the back half of the list, we go south of the border for my number three pick, Roma by Alfonso Cuaron. Cuaron's been one of the best directors working for a long time now with movies like Children of Men, Gravity, Itumama Tambien. He's become something of a master of spectacle, if you could say that. You know, big, big movies with scope and scale. But Roma combines that kind of skill for scale with a very intimate story, in fact, the most personal story that Caron could ever tell. He said in interviews that 80% of Roma is derived from his personal experiences growing up in Mexico City during the 1970s. In fact, the lead character played so well by Elisa Aparicio, 
uh, was cast less for her acting skills and more for the fact that she looked exactly like the woman who helped raise Alfonso when he was a boy. One of my friends somewhat accurately called this film kind of a mashup of Fellini and the Italian neorealism movement. Fellini, of course, wrote the script for The Bicycle Thief. That's one of the hallmarks of the Italian neorealist movement before moving on to his more fanciful movies like uh, Eight and a Half or his version of Roma. But ironically, the film that came to my mind, first of all, was actually a much different film, which was uh, Buster Keaton's The General. Buster Keaton, who's an absolute genius, made one of his masterworks, The General, in the 1920s about a runaway train in the midst of the Civil War. There are many great scenes in it, but one of the, one of the ones that always sticks in my head is there's a scene where Buster's quickly, he's trying to speed up this train uh, because he's being chased. And so this whole action takes place on top of the train with him running back and forth doing Pratt Falls and, and little bits of, of humor here and there. Uh, but all at the same time in the background, he's staged an entire reenactment of the Civil War. So you've got in the foreground, you've got some of the funniest bits you'll ever see on Earth. And then in the background, almost as an afterthought, you've got the entire Civil War playing out. Uh, and the frame is so brilliant because you're, you're using all corners of the frame. Everything in the frame, there's something happening. That's kind of how I feel about Roma. And what I think makes it such a brilliant film is there's so much going on. I mean, it was produced by Netflix, but I, I have to say that it's, it's, uh, it, it's almost a, a sin that peop most people will watch this film first on Netflix. It's kind of like watching Lawrence of Arabia on a cell phone. You, you need to try to see it on the biggest screen possible because there's so much richness of detail uh, in every single frame that I think you're gonna miss a lot if you just watch it on the small screen. I mean, from the opening frame of simple water rushing into a drain uh, to little details like the reflection of a plane flying above head, which is going to come back in later during the story. Um, there's another scene where Yalitzia goes to basically a kung fu camp, for lack of a better term. Uh, and it's just a simple scene of a car driving through a village on the way to this camp. But if you look at the breadth of the, of the, of the frame, you'll see that basically Curon has recreated all of rural Mexico in one shot. Um, and it's so, there's so much detail like that throughout the film that I think just from a pure filmmaking standpoint, this is easily one of the best films of the year. That brings us to number two, the runner up from my favorite movies of the year, which takes us to Poland for one of the greatest love stories of the year, Cold War. The story concerns the star-crossed romance of two lovers that takes place during the Cold War, starting just after World War II. It's directed by Paweł Pawlikowski, apologies if I mispronounced that, I'm quite sure I probably did, who was the same mastermind behind the film Ida. Both films share the same 4x3 aspect ratio, black and white cinematography, and both of, the, both of those films, especially this one, is a exercise in true cinema. And by that, I mean every single frame of that movie uh, is brilliant. Every shot in Cold War could be a movie by itself. Uh, the rich black and whites, the silver tone, it, it's, it's shot with such care and each frame is so well considered um, that you really understand that this is, this is what true movie making really is. This is, what, this is what it's all about. You add to that a simply electric performance by Joanna Kulig in the lead role, so alluring and so full of life that, you know, this man literally can't live without her. And likewise, uh, you know, she can't live without him. And their romance is, is tragic almost in the number of ways that they're torn apart, but also in the number of ways that they keep themselves apart from each other. It's one thing to have a love story that's completely derailed by external circumstances, but when you present fully fledged characters and you try to put them together, you understand that, you know, real people come with real problems that sometimes can create a gulf between them uh, even greater than that presented by communism. While we're on the subject of love stories, might as well just jump into it. My number one movie of 2018, A Star is Born. 
Now, I reviewed this movie earlier in the year after having seen it just because I loved it so much. In fact, seeing it was one of the reasons why I started, decided to start this vlog. Starring Bradley Cooper as a country rock singer on his way down and Lady Gaga as a pop singer on her way up, the outlines of the story have been told before. Five times before, as a matter of fact. But somehow, Cooper, in his first time in the director's seat, had brought an authenticity to this romance. These people feel real and lived in. You know, one of the things about the uh, Barbara Streisand version of A Star is Born is that, you know, you could never stop realizing that this was Barbara Streisand. In the case of this Bradley Cooper version, Lady Gaga sings so deeply into, into her role, and Bradley Cooper and her have such kind of interesting chemistry together that you really feel every, you know, moment. You feel every look between them. Um, it doesn't hurt that the soundtrack is amazing. And while this show is not about the best song category, I can't really imagine anything besides Shallow winning for best original song at this year's Academy Awards. It takes something really special to make a movie that everybody's seen before and everybody knows what's gonna happen and still have audiences crying in the theater or still have people walking out of the theater feeling emotionally moved. Um, and Bradley Cooper has just succeeded in this in spades. I know it might not be the most gritty. I know it might not be the most kind of abstract. I know it might not be the biggest kind of Oscar bait, but there was no other movie this year that I spent more time thinking about than A Star Is Born. There's no movie that I went for months on end telling everybody I could see that, that I ran to that they need to go check this out in the theater. I mean, I was working out earlier and I was still listening to the soundtrack on my uh, phone. So, it's, one that's, it's the one that stayed with me the most throughout 2018, and for that, it's my best movie of the year. Thank you for watching this extended episode of Movable Canvas, where we talk about the movies and what makes a good movie into a great movie. So what did you think? What were your 10 favorites of the year? What was your best picture? Did I miss anything on the list that you really think should have been there? Did you really agree with certain movies? Did you really not agree with certain movies on the list? Tell me about it in the comments below. And if you enjoy this kind of content, feel free to hit that subscribe button. I'll see you next week.